Good morning. Welcome to SOT. This is Dr. Major Bertrand D. Jarnett at the age of about 30 when he published his first book. And this is what he looked like in 1950 when he was very firmly established as one of the foremost chiropractic innovators in the world. And when I first met him in about 1985, this is more or less what he looked like. So welcome to the world of SOT. Dr. DeJarnett, Major Bertrand DeJarnett, was born in 1899 in Missouri. Supposedly, he witnessed a chiropractic parade down Brady Street in 1913, and it might have been that same parade where the rumor has it that B.J. sort of taunted his father and almost ran him over with a car. I don't know if that's true. I sort of doubt it. He enrolled at the Nebraska College of Chiropractic in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1921, became a, uh, an osteopath in 1922, and graduated from chiropractic college in 1924, and opened up for practice in Nebraska City, Nebraska in 1925. Uh, four years later, he got in trouble with the Nebraska Board of Chiropractic Examiners for using modalities. and really the Nebraska Board of Chiropractic Examiners were mainly medical doctors, if not all medical doctors, who ran the science part of the test to get a license to practice any kind of health care uh, back in those days in Nebraska. He used modalities back then. They were unusual modalities, but he did use them, and they were somewhat experimental. His earliest writings were on color therapy and Motor Control Over Blood Flow, 1930. He began teaching uh, in 1935 and offered a formal four-year postgrad course in SOT at Los Angeles Chiropractic College in 1949. He was appointed to the Nebraska Board of Chiropractic Examiners in 1954. Um, Etc. When I was uh, helping write the national board exams, I noticed a plaque on the wall at national board headquarters in Greeley, Colorado, uh, that had DeJarnette as a member of the first board of chiropractic examiners, and that was back in 1963. As most uh, pioneers in our profession uh, did, uh, Dr. DeJarnette came up with new methods, and he was very mechanically inclined, as was Dr. Gonstead and Dr. Thompson, etc. And uh, he was real interested in color therapy, how looking through lenses of different colors um, changed neurological function and physiological function in the body. And he patented this coaxial disc spectrum selector in 1933. Um, none of these are left that I've, I've seen. I've seen something similar to this that was an antique that he used, but I don't think it worked anymore. It's sort of too bad. Uh, I think more importantly for our profession today, Dr. DeJarnett patented the plumb line looking at a patient on a string. It was his patent. He was the first chiropractor to write a book about posture analysis called Spinal Distortion. I think that was 1934. And uh, in 1936, he patented the plumb line a simple device for looking at the patient's posture. Back then, he was doing mirror image adjusting. This patient has a left lumbar scoliosis, so he would probably um, uh, give the patient left lateral bends to do and adjust from left to right in an effort to straighten out that left scoliotic curve. Some people, he had a hard time uh, straightening out on the plumb line after he adjusted 
and um, came to the conclusion that the problem might be starting below the spine. So uh, this is his third patent, 1952. He might have had others. I, I, this was all I could find. 1952, if you look down at the foot plate and the patient's feet, the left foot on this woman is flat on the floor, and her spine uh, curves to the left. And when he put a um, arch support under the left foot on the right-sided picture, her spine straightened out, showing that sometimes the problem is below the spine as far as posture goes, and you got to pay attention to the feet. He wrote a lot of books. This is a list of all the books he wrote starting in 1930 and continuing all the way through 1982, um, Actually, this continued through 1984. His last SOT uh, uh, technique books were uh, printed in 1984. Actually, I have that on here, way up here, sacro-occipital technique. He kept modifying how to do the technique as he learned how to do it better. So everything you get in this course pretty much is taken from the 1984 manual of SOT. In 1957, he developed a, a board of directors to help him teach SOT and to also take over when he retired and passed away. And that was SORCI, the Sacro-Occipital Research Society International, uh, formed in 1957. The last time I saw Dr. DeJarnet was actually basically this picture taken in 1990. He was 90 years old. I was out at an SOT seminar in Omaha, Nebraska. So on my left is Dr. DeJarnet, and on my right is Dr. M. L. Reese, uh, a very close confidant to DeJarnet. And Reese came up with a modification of the ideas of SOT. Uh, and that's called soft tissue orthopedics. I never had the honor of being adjusted by DeJarnet, but I was adjusted by Dr. Reese. And this was Dr. DeJarnet's last office. Um, you'll see a, a, a man sitting by the door uh, next to the Commercial State Bank. That was a student of mine back in 1987. We went out to the SOT seminar in Omaha, Nebraska, and he drove down to Lincoln, to uh, Nebraska City, Nebraska, to see Dr. DeJarnet's last office. And uh, the office was upstairs uh, where those white awnings are. So you had to walk up a flight of stairs to see, to see him. He was already retired back then. He retired in 1985, I think. And there's two ways to use the material in this course. You can use it, uh, you can take the individual procedures out and just sort of insert them into what you already do, or you can do straight SOT. I use it to determine what is primarily wrong with the patient uh, on the first visit, and um, then I, I sort of pick and choose and use certain procedures out of SOT to help me correct what that problem is. That major problem that SOT points out is called the category of the patient. Um, so I do my adjusting, which is a combination of full spine and drop table and SOT blocking, and a few other things. I do extremities and cranial work, and sometimes I'll recommend dietary changes for the patient. Um, and then I recheck to see what SOT would say is the main problem with the patient. One of DeJarnet's teachers in chiropractic college was William Garner Sutherland. Um, he was the first, uh, this was an osteopathic college, not chiropractic college. Uh, Sutherland uh, passed away in 1954, but uh, he was an osteopath who followed the teachings of Andrew Taylor Still. Andrew Taylor Still was the inventor and developer of the osteopathic profession. Uh, 
in the earliest days. And Dr. Still said that the CSF was the most important fluid in the human body. So Dr. Sutherland figured, well, it's produced in the skull. We ought to pay more attention to the skull. So he was the world's first craniopath, pretty much. And he was one of Dr. Desjarnet's teachers when Dr. Desjarnet was in osteopathic college. The structure of SOT is illustrated in this slide. We're going to learn the category system. That is the uh, SOT approach to full spine chiropractic analysis and full spine chiropractic adjusting. After you become comfortable with that material, uh, if you like, you can learn um, CMRT, Chiropractic Manipulative Reflex Technique, which will teach you how to influence organ function through various reflexes and mechanical procedures on the body and the relationship between organs and the spine. You can also learn Dr. Desjarnet's uh, extremity approach, and you can learn the SOT cranial work at the very top. Uh, the fifth point of the star is ongoing research. It's how the technique is still evolving over time by having things modified and added to it by uh, SOT practitioners around the world. So, a unique uh, anatomical and functional concept that I learned in SOT is that the SI joint actually has two different anatomical parts and two different functions. The, uh, the posterior part of the joint supports our body weight via ligaments that are connected to a very rough part of the SI joint. On the dry spine, those ligaments are missing, and you can sort of stick your little finger in that space that was originally uh, filled with ligaments. Um, the anterior, more inferior part of the joint is the synovial part of the joint that allows a little bit of independent motion to occur between ilium and sacrum. And that independent motion uh, helps when we're walking uh, to create a little bit of a smoother, um, mm, smoother forces being imparted into the SI joint. Um, the sacrum almost acts like a gyroscope. It stays pointing forward. It doesn't move a lot, but the ilium can move a little bit with respect to the sacrum as the legs are moving. Well, that posterior sacroiliac weight-bearing joint with hyaline cartilage is what we call the category two part of the SI joint. And when it becomes traumatized and its function of weight-bearing is compromised, uh, we say that the patient is a category two. Motion palpation of the SI joint is based around the, the loss of weight-bearing ability of that joint. When you find a fixation on the right or the left doing motion palpation, you've actually just said that the patient is a Category 2 patient and has a problem bearing weight through one side or the other. What's happened is the muscles on the outside of the weight-bearing ligaments have tightened up to try to compensate for the fact that the ligaments aren't able to do a great job. You would think you were really mopalpating the synovial part of the joint, but the trouble with that idea is that the synovial part of the joint moves a maximum, in most cases, of 2 to 3 millimeters and has a rotation of 2 or 3 degrees. But on motion palpation, I think you would agree that the difference between left and right can be way bigger than that. It's not easy to feel two or three millimeters. And what you feel when you mopal the SI joint, I think, is a lot greater than two or three millimeters. So I think what you're, what you're finding when you're mopaling the SI joint is muscular fixation over a Category 2 problem of the weight-bearing part, the ligamentous weight-bearing structures being 
unable to do their job without muscle help. This was a paper written in the journal Chiropractic Technique, which is no longer in print. It was a um, peer-reviewed journal that was a very good journal. And a friend of mine wrote this article, Category 1, 2, and 3, three clinically related uh, categories of primary anatomy and physiology that were given attention to by Dr. Desjarnet. Category one has to do with breathing. Breathing, breathing. If there is a breathing issue with the patient, they're category one. Category one has everything to do with autonomic imbalance. Uh, symptomatically, category one people if they have pain, spinal pain, it'll usually be central. Won't be right or left. Uh, very often because of the autonomic imbalance, they have a variety of visceral issues, visceral complaints. Category two, people have a problem with that weight-bearing structure uh, of the SI joint and their symptoms are exacerbated by gravity. So they've got a gravity problem, whereas Category 1s have a breathing problem. Category 1 is much more primal. Category 2 has to do with the fact that there's gravity on Earth, and it will affect one or both SI joints in a weight-bearing way. 85% of all the patients you will ever see in practice will be Category 2. Category 3 um, is a lumbar disc issue, and these people have a hot low back, and this is affecting locomotion, getting from point A to point B. Category 3 issues can make pre-existing Category 1 and 2s much worse. But keep in mind, the vast majority of all the patients you'll ever see will be Category 2 at the beginning of care. There's some distinguishing characteristics of SOT. We use a category system of testing to see what category our patient is, and we classify them within a category. We do look at the extremity joints, the organs, and the cranium. We might use padded wedges or pelvic blocks uh, that the patient will lie on so they can sort of self-adjust their own low back. Most importantly to me, SOT offers a way to, to uh, catalog and file everything you know in chiropractic. When I first learned it, I called it the king of techniques. I don't know that it's the king of techniques, but it is a very logical way to look at what you do, what you've decided to do with the rest of your life as a chiropractor. It's not really designed for rote memorization. It's designed for understanding. Um, I don't find SOT chiropractors to be fanatical about their technique as much as they're fanatical about chiropractic. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. This is a Category 1 patient lying face up on a table. And in my mind's eye, I'm seeing the cranial dural structures, the Fox cerebri, tentorum and Fox cerebelli, the spinal dura, and the connection of those dural structures basically to the head and the tail the tail being sacrum. And the concept is that normal dural stresses, normal dural stresses are essential to life and health. And if there's a problem with stress within the dura and it's contained cerebrospinal fluid and the pumping mechanism of CSF, if, there, if there's a problem there, um, there's also going to be a problem with the non-weight-bearing part of the SI joint, the synovial part, that's anterior and inferior. Um, and you'll have a Category 1 patient on your hands. They'll have certain um, signs of being a Category 1.
you'll hear the term primary respiratory mechanism, or you'll read about it. And it's a, a concept from osteopathy originally that we've brought into SOT because we do category one work in SOT. Um, the primary respiratory mechanism could be viewed as another way of saying innate intelligence. It has to do with breathing. I think you would probably agree that if you're not breathing, you ain't got much innate. Um, but if you are breathing, you got innate. So when we breathe, we inhale and exhale. And the primary respiratory mechanism, which is called primary because it begins before birth, it has an inhale and an exhale phase also, but it doesn't have to do with lung breathing. It has to do with the production and pumping of cerebrospinal fluid. Um, on this slide, it has five components, and I got these out of an osteopathic book. The um, inherent motility, or all-by-itself motion, of the connective tissue in the brain and the cord. And the connective tissue are the glial cells. They, they coil and uncoil constantly. We know that cerebrospinal fluid fluctuates in volume and in pressure. That can be measured now. We know that when the spine moves, the dura has to go along with it. Any uh, very slight cranial motion might also include dural motion of the cranial dural, dural structures. The cranium itself has been theorized to move very, 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 very slightly. Um, and we know that the SI joints move very, very slightly. You take all this together, and that's supposed to be the the primary respiratory mechanisms. I'm not going to talk about these individual uh, research studies because I don't want this to take too long, but I do want you to read them. Um, they are fair game for uh, formal testing, like week three and week six in the final. So I want you to know what's been done in the research world regarding some of the stuff that we rely on in SOT. So there's a, a concept here called uh, the weight-bearing system. One function of the SI joint is motion, and that motion has been uh, compromised in Category 1 patients. Another function is spinal support during weight-bearing. The sacrum is suspended between the two ilia by the thickest, strongest ligaments in the human body. That support is compromised on the CAT2 patient. So there's a concept that the pelvis might develop category 2 to compensate for category 1. It's just something you might want to think about. And this is a transverse cut through the SI joint showing the posterior interosseous SI weight-bearing ligaments, the category two part, that right uh, arrow <laughs> isn't pointing, it's pointing to bone, it ought to be pointing within the ligamentous area. And uh, more anteriorly, totally anteriorly actually, is the synovial part of the joint that is responsible for motion and is the part of the joint that's compromised on category ones. In this slide, the patient's lying face up. They've been cut in half at the level of the SI joint, so you're looking at a transverse cut. So the Category 2 part is in the back, and the Category 1 part is in the front. Uh, more research on SI joint motion done with ultrasound. Be sure to read it. And Category 3 is all about <coughs> disc structural problems. The structure of the disc has degenerated to some degree. Um, this is usually the hot low back patient. And you, you guys know about the, the anatomy of a disc by now. You know that a bulging disc can affect the cord. It can create um, um, 
wow, it can affect the nerve root. Uh, it can close the area uh, within the cord. Uh, stenosis, it can create stenosis. And there's all different kinds of bulging discs. There's herniations and uh, degeneration of the concentric rings the annular fibers around the disc, all of that goes towards category three. So a summary of the category system of SOT here is that the category is the most immediate anatomical physiological dysfunction. If you have a category one patient on your hands, and we'll cover how to find that, how to determine if that's the case, um, they have a craniosacral dural, cerebrospinal fluid, central nervous system dysfunction of some sort. You will probably need to adjust sacrum on all Category 1s, and you very well may need to do uh, cranial work. Category 2, it's always an SI weight-bearing problem, which you folks already know how to deal with. If you know side posture from full spine, or if you know drop table from Thompson, you've already been doing category one work. We do it a slightly different way in SOT, but it's a weight-bearing neuromusculoskeletal dysfunction. And category three is your hot low back with disc dysfunction. Um, this is a chart that I got from my original SOT teacher, Dr. Sandra Lance, very good chiropractor. Um, you have, uh, in the center of this target, you've got clarity. No one could find a subluxation to adjust on you no matter what. Well, here comes some sustained stress. You pop out of clear and go into category one. It's a, a normal reaction to chemical, physical, or mental stress, uh, but it settles into your, uh, into your dural system and uh, compromises your ability to breathe normally. Breathing is an, is an autonomic function, and Category 1 um, affects autonomics because it's craniosacral, and that's where the parasympathetic input is located. So you're going you're gonna to have some autonomic imbalance. If you're not corrected, if you're not taken to a chiropractor as a child, you end up being a Category 2. And sure enough, 85% of my adult patients show up as Category 2s. Uh, whether they're Category 1 or 3 when they first come in, that's 15% of new patients total. Um, my experience has been about 5% threes and maybe 10% still category ones. Most people, when you run SOT tests on them, they'll show up to be a combination of category one and two. If you find that when you're first starting SOT, use category two procedures on them. Don't use category one procedures. That concludes this uh, introductory uh, uh, lecture on SOT. Thank you.